So there we go. So tonight we're going to welcome Beth Flores Sestra. Did I say that? I probably said that wrong. I'm so sorry. Okay, no worries. I got the Beth part right. We're welcoming yeah. Beth. She's a horticulturist from the Virginia Cooperative Extension, and she's going to teach us all about spotted lanternflies and help us identify them. Well, hopefully we won't see them, but when we do see them, which inevitably we will, she'll help us um, tell us where to report them and how to kind of try to slow the spread. So Beth, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Spring. Uh, good evening, everyone. As Spring said, my name is Beth Sastre. Uh, Flores is, is the one that I don't use here because it's too long. Uh, I'm originally from Mexico and I work for Virginia Corp Extension. Uh, many of you are aware of that, but if not, uh, we are an extension of Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. And what we do is we, all the research that is done by these, by these two universities and uh, any land, grand land university is passed on to extensionists like me. And then we pass that information to all the, uh, the citizens. Um, so I'm the commercial horticulturist and with me is Becky Hutchins and she is a volunteer master gardener. And I will say she is the expert on spider lantern flight because I have so many, too many things. Uh, she's always uh, keeping me, you know, in form of, hey, Beth, do you hear that? Or, do you see this? Like, I know, Becky, tell me more. Uh, but I work with all the, the farmers here in Loudoun County, and therefore uh, I started the campaign, awareness campaign with Spiral Launcher Flight. Um, so let me, uh, I think everybody can see my screen, correct? Yes. You can put it in, in the yes. speaker, um, in the view options. It's, it's on the view options, okay, yeah. uh, like screen, yeah. Presentation mode, correct? Yeah. Can you see it? As a, okay. So summary, we are gonna see it a lot as a, when we start seeing it here, when you see it on the news, uh, we're gonna be using SLF because it's easier. Uh, but the name is Spiral Launcher Fly. Oh, I'm sorry, let me just go this one. And um, there's its scientific name is the Corma Delicatula. Um, so, uh, this is an insect that is spreading very rapidly, is highly destructive for a uh, plants, especially trees, uh, and uh, you will see that uh, grapes, while cultivated, are also in danger. Uh, their eggs are cryptic, and when we talk about, you know, the insects and the eggs, we also imagine that we can see them just, yeah, just like an eye size level. It's not like that. You will find it on the ground. You will find it, you know, best uh, high size, and, and you can find it all the way out of the canopy of the trees. So it's, it's a little bit uh, difficult to uh, to look for it when it start when they um, when they it's just spreading, starting to spread. Management is expensive and is time consuming, and it has to be in a timely manner in order then to con to control it. Um, like I said, like I have a good control for, for it. Um, there is a future for biocontrol. Um, and what we are asking you is if you see it, take a picture, squish it or smash it and report it. Okay, so um, at the end, I want you to remember these things, and especially the report part. So what is pattern launcher flight? Spiral launcher flight is not a fly. Many people will think that it's a flight or it's a moth. It is not. It's a plant hopper and is the same, it's like a cousin of the cicadas. It started or is originally from Northern Korea and China, China, I'm sorry, and was found in Pennsylvania in 2014. However, is, uh, they, is, uh, we believe that it was, uh, it, it came or it arrived to Pennsylvania two years before because that's how we see how, you know, they, they arrived and but I, they are few specimens that you cannot see them right away. But after two years of establishment, that's when the population starts growing and that's when you see them or it's easy to find them. Uh, it was found in Virginia in 2018, so maybe it arrived here in 2016. Survived the polar vortex temperatures because it, once it goes to the, uh, once the eggs are laid down, they can survive uh, very low temperatures. Uh, it's polyphagous, and that means that feeds from different type of plants, 
flow and feeder, it means that it, it feeds from the sap of the trees, of the plants, and prefers tree of heaven. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Tree of Heaven, but this is another invasive, non-native tree, of course, from China. So the names of um, the spiral lantern flight are going to start climbing on trees or uh, small plants right away after hatching. It will, it, they will start uh, falling on the ground and climbing back again to the foliage. And I will show some of the structures uh, and why they fall so frequently when they are nymphs. Um, as they mature, they, start, they stay in one tree for a longer period of time. But when they are nymphs, they move from one, one, from one species of, of plant to the next one. Its hot, hot range is growth. Um, and then as, as young, they, they don't have any preference. They go to anything they can find. But as, as soon as they start uh, going to the uh, four nymphal stage or the, or the adult, they will be more selective. So how is it spreading? Um, it spreads, they, there are two types of spreading. One is short range and the other one is long range dispersal. So the short, short range dispersal is it, they start a flight or glide, especially now that it's very windy, they use this wind, even though they, are, they don't have a, 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 um, winds, they, the air can move them very easily, especially now that they are starting, uh, though they already hatch and they are uh, tiny, tiny nymphs. So the air can move them very easily. Uh, they can hop and they can walk. And the long range dispersal is thanks to us um, or infested commodities that we move from one place to another and egg masses. Um, it's a very good hitchhiker. Uh, especially on major points like on roads. Um, the adults are the ones that are very good at hitchhiking and they will stay on and lay down eggs on anything that is kept outside. And then when we move them from one place to another, that's how we can spread the, the spiral launch of flight. And also through the plants. So we, we have, a, if we are selling plants or a company selling plants in one place and you go, because you find them more, uh, you find them very uh, less expensive in another place, and then you start moving them from one place to another. So that's how we 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 can um, help to the spreading of this. And uh, by the way, if you have any any questions, please feel free to ask them. Becky is going to be answering the chat. So any any moment you have questions, please uh, just ask. So in 2014, um, it arrived or it was identified at in Berks County in, in Pennsylvania. So when they saw it, it was in high numbers. Uh, and that's why I said, you know, it is probably that they arrived in two years before that. And it was found in a rock yard. Um, this rock yard, uh, they found it on crates. So the crates had rocks and the eggs were on the crates. So that's how, how it started. So this is the distribution of Spartan Landerfly here in Virginia. Uh, and it was done by Dr. Pfeiffer. Dr. Pfeiffer is our entomologist viticulturist. And this presentation, he just did it last week. So I got this map from here, from him. So you will see all the pink points. Pink points are or dots are the positive. And then the black ones are a dot are the negatives, but we keep scouting on those areas. So you will see that uh, in 2018, June 2018, it started everything uh, on one square mile. By November 2021, it spread to almost 200 square miles. So it is very easy for them to spread, especially if you if you follow the the. The, the pink dots, you will see that that is 81. So a uh, mayor uh, roads, that's how they, they spread very easily. So this is a map that Cornell University keeps updating or used to keep, used to update every month 
they stop in March 2020. I think they are overwhelmed with this now. But if you look at um, how many states, I think there were 12 states that are a, a spiral amplifier has been identified. So let's go to Virginia, and then you will see that in Virginia, there are some counties that are on blue, and there are some red dots that uh, are there, um, are also there. So the counties that are on blue, they, they call it infestation present. The single dots are um, individuals or intercepts, that how that, that's, a, that's a name that Virginia Department of Agriculture gives them meaning that it's just one individual and they couldn't find eggs or nits. So I think, or I, I heard from some coworkers uh, and Virginia Department of Agriculture that this year, they are gonna add five more counties in Virginia to the quarantine area. And the quarantine area is represented by the red line. So you will see that in, here in Virginia, we have just three counties, which is Warren, Frederick, and Clark County in quarantine. And then I will talk about what quarantine means. But right now we have three, but uh, we are going to be adding nine more counties in quarantine in, in, in Virginia. So this map shows the, distrib the potential distribution of spider lantern fly in the United States. And it has to do with two things. One is the environmental conditions, uh, climate, and the other one is the spread of the tree of heaven. And I will talk more about the tree of heaven as well. Here you have the list of all the plants that spider lantern, have, spider lantern fly has been found on different stages, egg, uh, nymphs, or adults. But as you may see, you know, how many of you have crab apples at home? or ash trees, or a river birch, or maples, or cherries. So everybody has at least one of these. Uh, so you can find them on any of these trees. Let me see. There are some prefer host for pattern lunch of flight, depending on the, on the season. But as you may see, we have the rose, grape, wild and cultivated, tree of heaven, black walnut, butternut, river birch, willow, sumac, and maple, red and silver. So you will see that there are nymphs uh, that, you know, they, they will prefer certain plants during certain time and then the adults. But if you see, you follow the grapes and the tree of heaven, they like them any time of the year, nymphs or adults. And you will also find eggs on any of these two. So having said so, uh, the wineries is an industry that is gonna be highly affected by spiral and fly when it arrives and established here in Loudoun County. So I, I mentioned Tree of Heaven is one of the favorite hosts. Uh, first, because they know it very well, it's from China. Um, even though they like it a lot, it doesn't mean that they need it for the reproduction. They can continue reproducing without Tree of Heaven. Uh, however, they can survive better if there is Tree of Heaven. Why? Tree of Heaven has some alkaloids uh, and when the adults female adults start feeding from that, just before laying down the eggs, those alkaloids are passed on to the egg, egg masses or the eggs. And then they are, when, when, the individ, when they, they, they start hatching and growing, that alkaloids are gonna be in their bodies and they taste really bad. So we don't have many predators that will eat them because they are awful, they are untasteful. So, um, that is one of the things that we, we said, you know, if you can control, you can kill Tree of Heaven, do it, because that will help us to find more uh, uh, predators or predators will be more willing to eat them. Um, the other thing is when they find a place where they have 
different plants that they prefer. And when I say they prefer, I, I'm, I will say Tree of Heaven, um, grapes, wild cultivated, Virginia creeper, and maples, and locusts or black walnut. If you have those trees in one area, they will love it. They will stay there. And what is because, you know, they are going to have food from different sources and they are going to be healthier. So we are going to the life cycle of the uh, spider and fly. The eggs are going to be laid down from October to June. Then we have three nymphal stages. They are going to look exactly the same. It's going to be black with white dots, but the size is going to be different. So you are going to start finding them from May uh, all the way to July. And then we're going to see that they are going to change color. Still, they don't have wings, and they are going to be on the four nymphal stage, which is the red one, uh, from July to September. And then you're going to see the adults. Uh, and they are going to start uh, from, it says July, from July to, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, July to September, December. And then they are going to start laying down the, the eggs. And here I have another, uh, let me see, I think I missed something here. Oh, I'm covering everything well. So um, this is, these pictures show different um, egg masses on different type of trees. So on the first picture on your left, you're going to see that a, there are some like a clay-like color. And those are the eggs. So uh, as I said before, they are very cryptic in, in conspicuous. It's very hard to see them. And especially, you know, when they are high in, on the trees. So you need to have a trained eye to find the eggs. Then you have the picture on the right. And most of those eggs, uh, I don't know if you can see, but you will see like a black dot on each of, of those masses. And some of them do not have nothing like these two. They don't have nothing. So what it means is these are egg masses that are already hatched. And probably it was from last year. And then we have these two that are new. So they really, and, and here, these two also are new. They really like to lay down egg masses in the same place that they did it last year. Here we have a weather egg mass. So you will see these are the eggs. And then once the female uh, lay down the eggs, which she can do it between three and five times, and each mass will have between 30, 50 and 80 eggs. So you will see that these eggs are covered with that wax substance and that's what is protecting it. So I have these very cool pictures, which you know I, I think is cool to see this. This is one egg uh, and it's taking, uh, this picture was taken with an electronic microscope from someone from USDA. Um, and and see, it's, it's very cool to see the structure. So this, is the lead of the egg. So when they are ready to hatch, they just push it and it goes out. And you can see the, por the pores of a, you know, the structure of the egg. Then this part is the, is the front hatch or the lead. And, and you can see, you know, this is wasp. It's, it's, you know, different uh, type of uh, materials, but it's like a wasp. So you will see that it, there are some pores also and how it's, it's separated. So it's easy for them to just push it when they are ready to, to um, hatch. And then you see the pores on the side of the, or the, the red of the hatch door. And this is very important because that's the way how they, you know, some, uh, biorationals or organic pesticides will work with this. So you see that there are some these tiny holes that uh, I don't know exactly what will happen, maybe uh, regulate the temperature, um, oxygen, but it's very cool to see them. And then this is one pore magnified. So I just put them there because I love to see these type of uh, pictures under the microscope. So. When they just lay down the eggs, uh, the egg mass is going to be covered and it's white. It's, it's a very pretty white. Then uh, 
this one, I think it was taken in 2020 in Winchester by me, and it was September 17. So uh, you can see as uh, they lay down the, the egg mass, and then you see it white, very bright and uh, bright, and then the colors start changing right away. Um, so here we have two examples: one of uh, November 15 and March 16. So November 15, they lay down the egg mass, they cover it, and sometimes they run out of material to cover it. But this one was covered here, and then my coworker went back the following year to take the same picture, the, the picture on the same spot, and you can see how it starts, uh, you know, cracking. And uh, it helps them to start hatching. It's, it's gonna be easy to push it. But also, you know, the, all this material uh, that they are covered with protects them during winter. So you can see this one, uh, it, it was white and then started changing to this color. And then this one is, is an, an old one. And I'm gonna show you many pictures of this because that way you can be familiar by pictures and then maybe hopefully you can find it when you are walking, uh, hiking or you know, in your garden. And then the, the one on the bottom of your left, okay. you can see that there are some eggs that are already hatched. And you see that elongated structure is missing now. The one that I showed you uh, with the, um, uh, the previous picture on the with the one egg. So here are more, and these, as I mentioned, they 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 can lay down eggs anywhere. So this is a rock, and you can see on in the left all the egg egg masses. Then you see on wood material, plastic as well. You know all these. If you have kids and they have toys outdoors, they are gonna lay down the eggs there. We have more wood, rock, rusted material. Look at this, it's hard to, uh, to identify, uh, you know, if you don't have a trained eye. And all these were taken in Winchester. So look at this, you will have them here. And I think there was another one that wasn't pointed out, but, uh, but look at this. These are posts of a, a in a vinger, metal post, dusted metal as well, rusted metal, you know. <clears throat> and then they start hatching. Look at this. And you can see here how it's opening this, like at the, the, the door. And then they, they emerge and they are, when they start hatching, they are clear. But you can see the dot. Well, if you have a, a good uh, phone, you can uh, look at the, or, or hand lens, you can see the eyes of them. And uh, as soon as they start hatching, uh, it passes like a couple of hours and they are gonna turn black. So on this one, you can see the first instar, which is like a third sixteenth of an inch long. And then, um, and that happens usually when the temperature, so all the uh, living organisms that are cold blooded or they, ca they cannot regulate their, their temperature, they respond to something called degree days, growing degree days. So every every living organism has a growing degree days. So for example, uh, with the spiral lanternfly, for them to start hatching, it has to be an accumulation of 200 degree days from January. And and it's a very weird, uh, it's, it's a, there's a formula to calculate that. I'm not gonna talk about that. But uh, there are ways to find out when in the year we are going to have we are going to have certain degree days. So they respond to that, and you will need to remember that if I'm living in Ashburn and maybe the degree days are going to be reached out sooner than somebody living in the rural area because I'm surrounded by concrete, the temperature is is going to be uh, hotter. It's, it's going to be a uh, higher than in other places like our rural areas where there is not concrete, not many houses, more vegetation. So it, change a it changes a little bit. But around 200 degree days is when they start hatching. And then um, after one, two weeks, they, they pass to the second instar. One thing that is very important to remember is when they start hatching first and second instar, they don't move a lot. They, they stay on the same plant. Let's say if, you, if they 
hatch uh, on a tree of heaven, they are going to be there most of the time. But after the second instar, they start moving. And if there is wind, they fall down and then uh, they fall down and then they are going to start climbing up again. So they can disperse very easily with the wind, especially now. Uh, but initially, the, you will find them when they are hatching first and second instar, you are going to find a lot of them on one stem. So once they, they go to the second or third instar, that's when they start moving a lot. And uh, the third instar is going to be three eighths of a long three eighths of an inch long, and it's still the same color, black with uh, white dots. So they are very tiny, and if you you don't pay attention, you you can miss them easily. So if somebody during this time somebody reports to me as part of lunch of and they say they saw an adult, it's not going to be possible because right now they are not adults; they are names. So, and it's very hard to see it if you if if you don't have experience with this. So here's another nymph, and I want to show you why they they start climbing and they fall up, fall up the, the, the tree or wherever plant they are climbing. And it's, it's because look at the tip of the legs. So there is this structure is called arolium, and it's not fully developed when they are nymphs, first, second stage. So what is happening is, is they have something like on the lower picture uh, of the microscopic electron. Micro, uh, electronic microscope. So you will see that there is nothing here starts forming and then you start seeing how these structures like hooks start developing and you see the structure here start forming like a sponge and then once they are it's the third or the um, four in start um, and adults they start developing more till it matures. So this structure the aerolium is what allows them to hold very tight to the to the to any structure or any plant. As I said, immature stages can be found on stems yeah. or leaves. So here we have a tree of heaven, and you can see them here and here. And then when you want to get them, they move around the the stem and then they fall off. It's the same here. Look at this. You have them here. It's another tree of heaven. Uh, that also tree of heaven, they are they are climbing, and then you you see here the four instern. Uh, and here is one that is um, like chrysalis. They change, and this is the exoskeleton. And then once they 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 move uh, or they 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 um, go through the to this uh, stage. They have to wait a little bit to dry out, and then they are going to be on the four nymphal stage. And here is the four, and they are around seven eighths of an inch long. And this happened around June 26, but it's June 26, two years ago. Well, one of the uh, trends that we have seen is that every year it goes like a one week before the previous year. So here we have another a nymphal stage, this is the four one, and it's a handle of a wheelbarrow, I think. So then we're gonna have the adult, and the adult is around one inch long. Uh, this is gonna be happening from July to November. And uh, when they are, uh, there are two ways that you can see them. One, when they are like a, Tenth, they call it, um, with the wings along their body, and the other is when they are with the wings opened. And when you see them with the wings open and flapping, is we probably two things. The first one is they are mating, and or the second one is when they are sprayed with the insecticide or when they are feeding from a tree that has been sprayed with an insecticide. That reaction can happen. It, it happens. It's not like it, it happens. So it, they start feeding, and suddenly you see that they start stretching the wings, and they flap them a little bit, and then you stay like that with the wings uh, stretch. So here you see one adult laying, and it's a female, with a female with a that is that has a lot of eggs. We we call it um in. Oh my God, I forgot the name. I'm sorry. Well, 
Um, here we have the female gravid, that's the name. Gravid female the, uh, laying down the eggs, and you see first it laid down the eggs, and then it goes back and starts covering with this uh, wax uh, substance. On this one, I want to show you uh, two insects. Um, so the first one is going to be a male, and the second one is going to be a female. How do we know that? So the female has this structure, and this and it's going to be always red. So when um, if you look at them and, and before seeing this, they are not going to sting or bite you. They just feed from plants. OK, uh, so when you look at them, you're going to see on the on only on females that red structure, which helps them to push out the eggs. So here is the life cycle of spider lanternfly in Virginia. And as I said, this is very important for us to identify or when somebody calls me and says, hey, Beth, I saw a spider lanternfly. So uh, I have I have already had calls about seeing people seeing spider lanternfly, but they are not because what they saw they were what they thought they saw was an adult and adults are not uh, they are not ready yet. So you will see Many eggs, uh, and, and the egg mass can be uh, like a one inch uh, wide from one and a half length inch long. So they are big. But as I said, is they camouflage very easily because uh, the colors can be the same color than the trunk, uh, or you know a light variant of color, but it's it's, it's hard. Uh, then you're gonna have we're gonna have the names from uh, on all the, all the, from April, I will say part of April to September, beginning of the September. And then we have, we're gonna have the adults from July to November. And then we are gonna have eggs from uh, end of September to April, okay? So what is the risk from spider lanternfly? So we have three types of risks, risk and I always, going to talk about you know the risk for farmers because I work with them but it doesn't mean that is the only risk so it's going to be a, an economic impact because as you know you know we have a lot of farmers a lot of vineyards and wineries and agritourism and then also we have you know homeowners that have any of those trees that I show at the beginning of the presentation so imagine being outside trying to enjoy your garden or your bottle of wine and suddenly spider flies start coming to your table or your glass. Um, so it's, it's gonna be difficult for that. Um, we are gonna have to complain, comply with all the quarantine needs when it's here. And then it's gonna be a nuisance because they feed a lot. And, and they are gonna, they don't feed from the fruit. As I said, they feed from, from the phloem. So when they start feeding, they are gonna be excreting something that is called honeydew, which is sugar. Uh, and that honeydew will form sooty mold and then more bugs are gonna come and, and feed from there. So how does it feed? So they are, uh, as I said, they are the size of the, of the cicada. But how come an, uh, an insect like that can go through the trunk of the tree and they start feeding from the phloem? So one of the things is that they choose plants that are very healthy because when they are very healthy, they have good gravity. So the phloem, uh, the, the sap is gonna be moving very easily in, into the vascular system. So they, they don't have the, the, the organs to suck the sap. But, as, but they have the organ, which is the proboscis, uh, it's the mouth part that you see there. It's like a needle. So when they insert that and the tree is healthy, the phloem is gonna be, uh, the, the sap is gonna be going through their mouth system and then they are gonna be feeding from it. So it's, it's very easy for them. And for that reason, they choose trees that are more healthier than others or healthier. The other thing is um, now we have a lot of tree decline due to different things. Is environmental, um, different diseases, other 
organisms. And then we're going to have this one that also is going to be, it's like, as you know, we have, uh, when we have anemia, uh, we're not feeling well, something like that. It's, it's going to be the same like for the plants. So they are going to be exposed to another stressor. And we may see some trees that are, you know, are going to turn yellow. We haven't seen a lot of trees that are dying because of that. But the problem is, you know, once they start uh, feeding from trees, and you're going to see many, many thousands sometimes. It's, hopefully, we don't see that. But I saw that in Winchester. So thousands of uh, insects feeding from trees. So imagine all those uh, uh, wounds that they are uh, making on the trees. So it, the, it's open, it's an open wound that, that it will be uh, um, more susceptible to infections for fungi or bacteria. So uh, it's, it's another stressor for our plants. Here I have uh, several things. So you will see that, as I said, you know, they start feeding and they feed a lot. So when they feed, they have to excrete something and that is called honeydew, which is very sweet. So the honeydew starts accumulating on the foliage, lower foliage, or, and all along the, tr the trunk of the trees. And then once the honeydew starts uh, uh, setting down there, there's going to be a fungi, which is called sooty mold, which starts feeding from that, and it's going to turn black. So what happens when uh, it turns black on the leaves? So uh, the lower... Um, all the all the the plants that are in in the under the canopy of the trees are not going to be uh, photosynthesis uh, producing uh, carbohydrates through photosynthesis the same way because they are going to be blocked by the pseudomon. Then uh, on the picture of your right, you're going to see many adults that are still feeding, but also you're going to see some white spots, and that is yeast. So once the pseudomon forms, there's going to be some yeast. And you can smell it. The smell is strong. And usually you will see it uh, on the on trunks or around the trunks when the sooty when when the sooty mold or the, the honeydew starts uh, you know dropping, then the sooty mold forms and you will see them mostly on, on the around the trees, uh, the trunks of the trees. So what are impacts we have on trees and goody plants? So as I mentioned, the plants are going to show stress. Um, they are not because the 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 spider lanternfly is going to be feeding from a long period of time. the The purpose of the plant also is to, when once they start uh, having leaves, they are producing. Uh, they are through photosynthesis. They are producing more carbohydrates, and those carbohydrates are go, are going to be sent to the roots. Correct? It's like at the bank for them. So, because uh, spiralandrafly is going to be feeding through almost the whole year, when they are working hard to get carbohydrates, the, the spiralandrafly is going to be feeding. So it's, it's taking away some of the carbohydrates that they have for storage. So you will see, you may see that the next year your trees are not growing well. Um, maybe they are going to be more susceptible to other problems and diseases, as I said, because all the wounds. And, and then the indirect, pro, uh, indirect uh, impacts is going to be the honeydew will attract other insects. And in fact, there were some reports, not that of spider lantern flight, but of bees going into a tree, lots of bees and ants. And then uh, when the uh, extensionist in, in Pennsylvania went to see, it was not direct uh, caused by the bees or the ants. It was this, this spider lantern fly feeding and then producing a lot of honeydew and then attracting all these insects. And as I said, it's gonna form the sooty mold. You're gonna see if, if you have a, if the kids have toys under the trees, because usually it's shaded, so you will have the toys under the trees, they are gonna start, you know, the, the honeydew is, or the, the the honeydew is going to be uh, depositing on the, on the, on the, on the uh, toys or the, the games. Uh, the playgrounds, um, and then the sooty mold starts forming there, and then you're going to see the yeast. Um, and as I said, the, 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 the underdevelopment of the second story plants is going to be very remarkable because they are going to be, you know, they are, they are not going to be able to produce carbohydrates. So 
what's happening if we are in quarantine? So you as a homeowners, uh, you, you don't have the same uh, legal requirements than people making business, but we have, you know, conscious, uh, and we, we will have, or I will ask you to do the same. Uh, but for businesses, any, any business bringing a material or anything, goods from counties that are in, are in, are in quarantine are obliged, must check everything before they live in that uh, county that is in quarantine. And if we are in quarantine, we have to do the same. So we have, or if we go to a place that is in quarantine, we have to check everything before coming back. Uh, for quarantine, it means that uh, also, besides inspecting that, they have to have a training. Now, what are the best management practices for sport and lantern flight? The first thing is always look for egg masses and insects. And I said, you know, egg masses is very hard. Finding insects on the first, second, and third instar is a little bit hard. And you know the four instant the adult is easier, but if you find them, we ask them to scrap out, smash, egg masses, and kill the insect in on any stage. Um, there are things that we are recommending, uh, but I know that each one has its pro and cons. Sticky tape uh, or banding uh, is recommended on high risk areas. Um, and there are some other things that we can use to control or to stop from other uh, animals or insects or to stick on those. Also, uh, we recommend alternative trap and we call it circle traps. A con uh, control of tree of heaven is very important, although it's expensive, but if you can do it, we recommend that. Uh, tree of heaven is also one of the trees that a uh, brown marmoray steambug likes to lay down eggs. So that is um, that is important. And we said use sentinels to monitor. As I mentioned before, adults will always go at the end of the life cycle before laying down eggs, they will go to tree of heaven because that way they know they can have those compounds that are gonna make them feel uh, taste uh, really bad. So the, the recommendation is identify the tree of heavens that are in your property, find which one are male and which one are female. Both of them are gonna produce flowers, but just females are gonna produce seeds. So flowers are gonna be happening next month. Uh, and at that time you cannot say this is male or female, but around September, is when you're gonna see the seeds. So that is gonna be a female. So why we recommend to kill most of the females because they are the ones that are gonna be reproducing, producing seeds and they can reproduce by seeds. And then leave one adult, which has a trunk of six inches of more. And then that's the one that you use the circle trap of the sticky tape. And that is to, to see if you have them in your property. It's not attracting them because, uh, uh, well, it's, it's not like a, like they, we start using the traps for Japanese beetles. It's not doing that, but they, if there is a tree of heaven, they will go there. And then that you know that is in your property. And as, as you know, it's not gonna be just feeding from tree of heaven. They have some other uh, host that they will like. The other thing is if you, when you are leaving this county and go to counties that are in quarantine and, and now you know, which counties, and if you don't remember, just go Cornell Spotter and flight map, and you will see, as I said, the more recent is for March, March. So you will see which counties and which states uh, Spotter and flight is present. So you know that is there and you are gonna be more careful. Never park under the trees because they are going to be there, and then if you go there and 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 one of them likes your car, they you are going to be they're going to be hitchhiking on your car. So never park under under the trees. Also, always close the windows. That way you don't bring them with you. And then when you are going to be controlling it, 
first use the less toxic approach. Uh, if you see it, please report it to ex our extension office and it's gonna be Loudoun County Sport Lantern Fly. If you are not sure that this is Spot and Lantern Fly, you can send an email to Loudoun County Master Loudoun Master Gardeners at vt.edu. So either one you can send, you can report it. So what is the control? So we have something that is called, um, let me see if I can make this smaller. No, yeah. We have something that is called, ooh. okay. So um, we have something that is called integrate pest management. And integrate pest management is the use of all the tools that we have in the toolbox to control something. As you may see, the big base is cultural. And then we have from we have we go from prevention to intervention. And then as we go up on the pyramid, we are increasing the toxicity. So the first thing will be cultural practices. Then will be physical and mechanical, then biological, and then we have the chemical, which can be biorational or conventional. And for example, cultural practices will be okay. So if you can, don't um, try to control tree of heaven. Okay, that will be one of the cultural practices. And let me see if I have them here. Oh. Also, biorationals and biological are called biocontrol. Um, here we have a, when we need to treat and how we need to treat. So when we have eggs from January, April, November, December, we ask you to scrap the eggs, apply dormant oil to egg masses. And it, that is in, especially during January and April. Then from May to October, use sticky band traps on trunks. And then also you can use insecticide, contact insecticide uh, spot spray, spot treatment, that's what we call it. There is another one that is soil range of systemic insecticides. And you can ask anything about this. Uh, I know that there are many people that are concerned about this. Uh, you can use organic sprays or biological control. However, bio biological control is not widely spread right now. Still, you know, the researchers are doing more research on, on biological controls. And one thing that we all can do during the whole year is do not move any infested material. Oh, here I have the use the sticky traps, sticky trap or you also use the circle trap. And here we have the, the mechanical control. Uh, so you can use a stick um, to scrap it or a credit card. And then a, what the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture was recommended to put it in a bottle, uh, you can put it also in a bag with alcohol. Um, but first, before you do that, take a picture and then you can um, you can do the, that. Uh, you can just scrape it out or smash it you know, with a credit card or your finger. So here I have a, a circle trap. We call it also funnel trap. Uh, and I learned something very interesting. The name of circle trap is not because it's a circle or circles the tree, it's because the person that made it, it's, his last name is circle. So this is the circle trap. Um, and now it's a little bit different. That was the one that we were using last year. This year we're gonna be using, instead of this plastic bottle, we use just zip bags. Uh, we have the same system here, but here on the on the top goes a zip it back. And then I have a video. Let me see if this will run. Can you see it? Can you see it? 
If somebody can tell me. Yes, we saw it. Thank you. Yes. Can't hear it. Is it paused? It's not. You don't see it? No, we see it, but we don't get sound. Oh, you think? Okay, so let me do something. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to go to YouTube. Let me just pause this. Oh, hold on a minute. Let me just do. Oops. You know what I can do? I'm gonna keep talking, and then at the end, I'm gonna show it. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. That way, we don't, I don't mess up with the presentation. Okay. And this is a sticky trap. And as uh, we were talking with some of you about the concerns of this trapping something else. And they, yes, they will trap something else. So this is something that a uh, Pennsylvania start doing. So the, the sticky trap uh, we are using now is not as wide as it used to be. And then on top of them, on, on top of it, they will put this mesh uh, to protect. So the purpose is for the insect just to go because we know that they, they walk, they start climbing up. Um, there are going to be other insects that will do that, but you know, not not many of the beneficials or the small mammals or reptiles or a, or birds that will stuck in that. So this is a modification of the old sticky trap. Um, this is one that was used in a Vinger, and you will see the difference. You see a lot of flies, but then you also see those names. And usually, uh, you know, flies, because they are flying, you will see them everywhere. But the names, you will see them all the way on the bottom because they start climbing up always. Um, we have pesticide control. And as I said before, we have the organic control. We have, we have predators and we have the microbial control. So since we are gonna start talking about pesticides, it's very important for you to read the label. Even if this is an organic pesticide, always read the label. Uh, being organic doesn't mean that it's not gonna kill other beneficial insects or, uh, or risk the environment, okay? So always like read the label. Uh, the label is a legal contract between you, EPA, and the company that makes the, the pesticide. So always read the label. And even though you are using the same pesticide and you went and buy another, another bottle, read the label because sometimes the, ingre the active ingredients change and therefore the, their recommendation changes. Or maybe they were allowed to spray it in one plant and then next time they have to take that plant out of the list and you cannot spray it in that plant. So always read the label. Oh. So we have, we have biocontrol uh, and it's a, this is microbial control for a spider lantern fly. And we have two right, right now, Burkholderia species and then Bavaria vaciniana. And it, these two are not widely spread. They still doing some research. Uh, USDA is using it just uh, to test. Uh, and some uh, in, in Pennsylvania, Department of Agriculture and here Virginia, Department of Agriculture, but it's not as widespread as in Pennsylvania. So uh, Bavaria species uh, is being found in the wild now. Uh, two years ago, they found some specimens in Pennsylvania 
And Dr. Ann Hatchek is asking anybody that sees something like this to bring it to the extension office and then we will send it to Cornell because there are different species. So they want to identify exactly what, what are the species that will um, be parasitoids of the spider and fly. One important thing is, you know, in order for these fungi bacteria to, to be parasitoids, they need the right environment. So for example, right now it's a good environment for them to survive because it's humid and it's warm. So that's what they like. But if by the time they are adults and it's dry, they are not gonna survive. Even if we spray them, it's, it's not gonna work. So that is one of the limitations for this type of biocontrol. So if you see on this one, and there is a tiny wasp and they are very good. However, because they are tiny, they are very susceptible to anything, especially insecticides. So, in, uh, you know, there is this thing that we are doing when there is an infestation, we need to control them right away. And in, while controlling them right away through a conventional insecticides, we are also killing some of the natural uh, uh, native species that could control it, not control it, but could be a parasitoids of those. They cannot control it right away because always, if you, if you see how mother nature works, bad guys are a lot. And then good guys is just like one, two, three, but they, they fly, you know, different ways. So that's what happens with this type of parasitoids. You will never find many parasitoids as you will find this spider fly. And you will see on the on on the spider lantern flight that is next to the other one is being parasitized. So what it happens is that this tiny wasp will lay down an egg inside the spider lantern flight. The egg starts growing and then it hatches and it starts feeding from the spider lantern flight. And it, these examples like this happen on many species uh, or many um, many many pests. So this is um, those when Sirtus cubana cubani, which is um, a parasitoid of the gypsy moth. And they have seen that all we also parasitize the eggs of spider and fly. So do you remember when I showed you the eggs that were already hatched? It, it was, uh, it showed an elongated opening. When the eggs are parasitized by this uh, tiny wasp, what happened is you will see a circle instead of an elongated opening. And that is where the, the tiny wasps hatch. So these wasps will deposit an egg inside. When the egg um, becomes a larvae, they start eating. And then when, it, when it's ready to hatch, it's just opened and it will go, uh, will merge the adult. But is gonna be a circle instead of an elongated opening. So um, what they saw is that seven, and this is already here in our environment, and they saw that 7%, about 7% 7 of the eggs were parasitized. Uh, and they count like 20% of the egg masses had this type of parasitoid. Uh, but it wasn't found in many locations. And especially, you know, the problem is, as I said, when they start trying to control spiral lanternfly, well, they have to spray insecticides and these uh, beneficials are very susceptible. This is another one that is also parasitizing, parasitizing uh, nymphs. In this case, we have the adult, we have another one that parasitizes the eggs and this one parasitizes the nymphs. So you will see here on this nymph, how the how is growing the egg inside it. So once is uh, if the if the, the larvae starts uh, growing, it feeds out and then hatches. We have another one. Uh, this one uh, will emerge twice, um, and they can parasitize eggs. Also, uh, they can parasitize uh, nymphs. And these are, uh, this is on uh, the research. 
We have seen some predators, but not very common. Um, web uh, spiders, mantis, green mantis. And then do you know which one is this one? One. Assessing bug. So they are very good for that. So these are biopesticides that are being used, uh, especially oils. Uh, Virginia Department of Agriculture is using oils on egg masses. So they are using neem oil, also um, horticultural oil, and this one will be more like a canola oil. And these two are the ones that are being spread um, by Virginia Department of Agriculture. Um, we have natural pyrite rinse, we have insecticidal soap, uh, and dormant oil, which will be something like it, or cultural oil and neem oil. So we can, oh my, we can uh, apply, apply these to the trunk, uh, the branch and foliage. The dormant oil says do not apply to the foliage. Why? Because we can, we can um, burn it. Um, and do not apply during, um, so dormant oil is important to apply it when, uh, before plants start uh, breaking the buds, because once you apply when it already broke the, 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 the buds are a uh, breaking dormancy. And if you apply it at around that time, that's when we start, we will kill um, the foliage. So do not apply this one on the foliage. And then we have also the times to control it. And as you may see, um, it can be most of the time is made through early July. Uh, let's see. So on egg masses, you can apply dormant oil and also the, the horticultural oil. Let me see. Or dormant oil during um, mid February to late April for egg masses. So we are ready up late for this for this uh, application. Then we have a conventional pesticides and within the conventional pesticides, we have something that is called systemic. And systemic means that when you spray it in one part of the plant, it will move through the whole plant. Uh, let's say you spray it to the trunk and will move to the leaves and then it will move to the roots. So the whole plant, the whole specimen, it's, it becomes poison. So we have dinotepran, imidacloprid, and then we can use those on soil drench or trunk spray and trunk injection. And the times to control is July to September after flowering and July to September. Always avoid when the, when the plants are blooming. Then we have a conventional pesticides that are by contact, meaning in order to kill the insect, we have to touch or we have to spray that insecticide directly to the insect. So we have bifentron, carboryl, uh, zeta, cipermethrin, malathion, fluvalinate, and tebulcosona. Uh, some of these you are not gonna be able to get, Bifentron and carboryl, yes, um, also malathion, but a, you know, as I said, you need to read the label and be very careful when you spray it because they can kill any insect. Uh, and a, so no spraying when there is a blooming. So here I have the kill kit. And this is what Becky uses. She's always very well prepared. You see, she has the uh, spiral lantern fly cards and scraper, and then the stick, the fly swapper. And then we all, this is uh, because we were scouting, we needed to use um, insecticide to avoid the ticks to go in uh, us. And then she has the containers and bags and alcohol. And then 
you will see this is my kill kit. <laughs> Very practical. Uh, okay, so this is a video of Sparalantra fly feeding in a vineyard, and you will see they are on the, the grapes, but they are not feeding on the grapes, the fruit. They are feeding on the on the stems. And look at all these droppings. That's this, this uh, honeydew, okay? And see here, this is honeydew coming out of the insect. So the amount of honeydew that they excrete is, is a lot. So if you are under, under a tree that is infested, look at this, that is infested with spiralantra fly, you feel like it is bristling. So it's, it's really incredible. Okay, so the take home message is Most of the insecticides are very effective to control spiralantra fly. The, oh, the organic options are good. They are going to work. And these are neem oil or insecticide soaps or the canola oil, which is also agricultural oil. However, you need to apply them very frequently. We know that there are several, several predators and parasitoids for spiralantra fly but they cannot control uh, established population right away. And um, one example is a brown marmoray sting bug. So it arrived almost 10 years ago, right? Until last year, we started seeing that, uh, yes, we have been spraying insecticides to kill it, but until last year, two years ago, we started seeing that more and more eggs are being parasitized by the by the wasp so it took them that long to reproduce and be able to parasitize more eggs than uh, eggs than before we know that also have a uh, fungal pathogens that can attack sparrow lantern flight uh, and they are here in the united states but they cannot reproduce it yet to sell it Till they do more research and the truth is that these can last like uh, between three five years so um, it's a long way for us still for this type of control we have several publications in english and spanish um, you can find that on loudon.gov spider launcher flight or a uh, vgedu spider launcher flight and we ask you to go to those because their recommendations every state has uh, regulate pesticides. So maybe Pennsylvania is recommending something that we cannot use here in the in, in Virginia. So it's important to you can look. You know, it, it, we it's good to look at all the publications from any extension uh, state. However, when we are talking about pesticide, any type of pesticide, biological or conventional, is always good to go to your state extension department because they are the ones that are going to be recommended with is allowed to use in Virginia. Um, the other thing is that uh, your observations are important and you are very good at that. So if you see another parador that is eating spider and fly, please take pictures, record that and report that the birds biting that box. So we are going. We are not going to stop spider and lantern fly. Uh, we can slow the spread, but it's not going to be something that we we said we, we are going to exterminate it. So we need to work together in order to to slow the spread. Uh, always use integrated pest management, and when I say that, is uh, remember the cultural, mechanical, biorational, and then application of insecticides. So, allianteus control is very important. I know it's expensive, but if you can do it, please do so. Uh, insecticide application, banding, and and banding maybe is is more effective just to see if you have it in your property. Banding, when I say banding, is also a, the circle trap. Scrap egg masses, um, 
look before you leave. So if now that, uh, you know, it's going to be a break, uh, if you go somewhere else, please, before going to somewhere else, that place, look on the map and see if spiral lanternfly is being reported there. That way you are going to be aware that you are going to go in a, to a place where spiral lanternfly is. And a, maybe by that, by that time, the nymphs are a little bit bigger and they can hitchhike. Uh, now that you know more about the spiral lanternfly, please educate the community and your friends. Um, as I said, spiral lanternfly is not going to eat or, is, or bite. Uh, there are some reports of animals that uh, animals like a pets that have it in spiral lanternfly and they throw up because it tastes bad due to the alkaloids from the tree of heaven. Um, spiral lanternfly is not a vampire. It's not going to suck your blood. Uh, and then if you are going to hire a company to control it, hopefully you don't have to, but if you do that, uh, ask them for their pesticide certification. It's very important because once it's here and if we reach the numbers that I've seen, uh, and may, you may be aware of uh, Winchester and Pennsylvania, it is really bad. So. Spraying pesticides is not something that anybody should be doing. Uh, you need to be aware that uh, there are some uh, risk. So hire some, somebody that is trained to do that. So what we have done is this talk is, is one of the many talks that I have been doing since 2018. Um, we have been working with the county to support for press release. Uh, we have been working on uh, reporting capa capabilities. I've been putting traps uh, since 2018 in several vineyards in our county. Uh, as you may have seen on the map, we are surrounded by it. So I'm pretty sure it's here. It's just that I don't have all the, or we don't have all the eyes that we need to, to find it. So please, uh, if you, Wherever you go hiking, uh, please look for it. And as I said, you know, they like spider lanternfly. They, they like um, Virginia creeper. They like wild grapes. So those are the places that, you know, are, are very easy to, to look for. Uh, if, if you would like to volunteer or to place traps, please contact us and we will provide you with one. So as, as I mentioned before, if you if you want to report a sighting, go to loudon.gov, spiral launcher flight. Um, if you want to volunteer or if you are not sure that that is spiral launcher flight, please contact Loudon Master Gardeners at vt.edu. Also, if you want a uh, speaker, you can call us again. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do more talks, but we have this recorded. But Becky, as I said, she is great at that. And if she has the time, she's a volunteer. So if she if she can, she can do more talks. So are there any questions, comments? Oh, let me show you. Do, do we have time to, to look at the... How to make a trap? Or we can, or I, I can that's up to the people on the call. So what I can do is I can also put the 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 address on the chat. And let me go to that. Oh, that might be a good idea. Yes. So let me do that. And that way, anybody can watch it as you wish. Okay, hopefully this is the one. Okay, uh, is there in the chat? Yes. 
Well, I hope you, you learned something. Um, let me know if you have questions, comments. We got a quiet group tonight. <laughs> If you guys do come up with questions, you definitely know how to reach them. So please feel free to ask anytime. Okay, well, thank you very much, Beth. And thank you, Becky. We appreciate it. We appreciate the information. And um, hopefully we won't find one. But when we do, we know where to report them now. Yes, please, Spring. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Right. Have a good night. Thank Have you. You summer. too. Good night. Thank you, ladies. Thanks.